My name is uh, Michał Staniszewski. I came from Poland. Um, I was active on the demo scene for, uh, since 1997, and I was present there by a hand with bonsai from plastic. And today I will talk a little bit of a creative process of uh, making our recent project bound. So I will show the trailer uh, of the game so you will have like, you will know what I will talk about later on. Okay, so who is Plastic? Plastic is a small studio in Poland specializing in making really experimental stuff, different experiences. We have uh, roots in demo scene since 1997 and we've made a couple of, of demos that were nicely re um, received in Europe. And then uh, Santa Monica Studio External contacted us in 2006 and asked us to make an interactive something for PlayStation 3 because they wanted to create a digital community on uh, PlayStation 3 and ask several um, groups, demo scene groups, um, for help. And we made Lingering Shadows. Some of you may um, remember it. And then we've made Datura, which was another experimental production um, from designed for PlayStation Move. And at that point, we, uh, we were like having tiny experiences with like very early virtual reality. And it was too early for that game <laughs> for that time. Okay, so after that tour, we were thinking to what to do next. And we've made Katsila to refresh the engine. So the thing is that we are really weird studio that makes an engine for each of our project, which is pretty crazy, but it actually works. And uh, we are thinking that like what we are good at, and we went back to the productions from the demo scene, and we were still looking for a new direction. We knew that we were good technically, we could like made a lot of stuff on screen dynamic without too many problems and fighting with, with the technology. But at the same time, Journey was released, which was a great emotional game, maybe more an experience than a game. And I always wanted to make a game with a strong female character, like in Miyazaki movies. But most importantly, my son was born it was uh, six years ago, and this got me thinking into family uh, team. So, I've, at first I called it Equality, um, and the code name for it was The Princess. It was a, a narrative, it, it sh it's supposed to be narrative, not game, with a fragility of the family as a main theme, 
presented in the form of metaphor, but it was like a very ambitious on paper, so actually it also contained persistent multiplayer world with structures, structures based on a lot of iterations from different players. But we also were thinking about speedrunning element uh, because we were working with different digital um, communities. We were working with Demoscene, we were working with Katsilla, which is the overclockers community. And right now we wanted to work a little bit with speedrunners. But the most important thing was the concept of showing the story in a way that the players will have a different view on it and they would judge it on, it, uh, on its own. So in the, in the family problem presented in the game, we, we didn't want to show any, anyone from the family as particularly bad and leave the interpretation to the player. So we, at some point we had the first working prototype. Like I, like I said, we are rewriting engine for, for every project. So um, we had those design blocks and tools written from the, the scratch. Um, so these are like a simple shapes with physics and working camera around the character, like the TPP camera, the events that change the camera. But the thing was that I, for the 3D platformer, I needed more, uh, more depth and visibility, so I asked uh, the, uh, one of the programmers to add me a lighting. And we got the first look of Unreal World. I always wanted to have in this project the red sky and the ocean of cubes that would cover the distances between the ar architecture. The red sky is inspired by a demo in production from 2002 called Chimera by Halcyon. And it's a very, very important production because it's a milestone in terms of dividing a moment where the demo scene was not mostly about competing programmers and competing artists, but um, the demo started to, they, they wanted to present some kind of content and some kind of meaning and uh, to become an art form. And Halcyon was done by, in 2002, it was um, supposed to be shown on one of the biggest demo scene parties, but it was disqualified because it was too abstract and, um, and um, organizers like, didn't feel that it fits into the category. Um, the imp interesting thing about Chimera is that the music for it, like the ambience, was done by Jako Isalo, Croker, and he's one of the original authors of Angry Birds. So he designed the characters in Angry Birds. So you can start with, with such design to, to go completely different places. And the Ocean of Cubes is inspired by a 64K intro, Texas, from 2008, made by keyboarders. It was the first production on demo scene that used geometry shaders. So we had a lighting in uh, Unreal World, but we were still thinking that um, what will be the actual look. We were at this point thinking about those as not the actual graphics, but we knew that the, uh, that the long shadows are very important uh, for a production. On the other front, I was uh, trying to design a mechanic that will cooperate with the story where the character wipes away her memories and to making the, the world disappear. So this concept was pretty unique. I, actually, I felt it was unique, but later on I discovered that uh, 3D Mario World has exactly the same mechanic uh, in, the, in the more difficult levels. But um, this kind of look didn't uh, fit uh, our previous efforts. So um, I asked for like showing it in a, in a different way and we've changed it to, to dividing the cubes that we already have uh, into a smaller chunks. And actually, it, we were surprised that it worked so well, and uh, it was pretty simple. So the thing is that we didn't have the, any kind of physics in there, just mathematics that just displays the, the blocks um, if they are distant, more distant from the character. 
it's, it, uh, no physics was used because the maths are just faster and we could show a lot and a lot of those chunks. And we were um, iterating on, on those elements and we got inspired by modern art. I, I will talk about it uh, later on in the talk. But we had to design some extra, um, extra mechanisms like control zones who, uh, like, who tell the designer what parts of the world are more visible. And there was a tons of uh, parameters, but in the end we've managed to shrink it just to the minimum and maximum distance when the displacement happens and max minimum and maximum distance when the scale happens. But we also had zones to, to maintain the, um, uh, the architecture of the Unreal World if we wanted to show some kind of buildings in the, in the distance. Um, and also we had um, a scripting, uh, simple scripting of the destruction, so we could use it in cutscenes and completely hide them or to reveal them or uh, simple, simple things. But our game also um, is about memories, so uh, we started to write another piece of code with the fragments that come together when you get closer, so you could see what's inside the memories of my character. The funny thing about it is that it was running entirely on GPU, but together with the gameplay mechanics. So actually, G uh, GPU, uh, we've checked on GPU which, uh, which chunks got into their places, and based on that, we've opened the door to the next parts of the game. Um, the chunks were pre-processed, pre but it was like very, very fast, so, whoa. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and we, we had to iterate more on the memories because um, um, black and white was like grayscale was really hard to read by the players and we've added uh, diffuse lighting so the characters could be seen as, as different. Um, the overall design of the memories is mostly influenced by Gone Home. Um, so environment, environmental storytelling works best when the items are placed in the, in the uh, places where they actually should be. Um, so, but, but it was still hard for the players to read what's happening in there. And we ended up with uh, going back with the, the textures that have pre-baked lighting and to, to make the characters more distinguishable from each other, we had to use like the, let's say the standard uniforms for kids, so bl uh, blue and pink, um, change the, the haircuts so players will exactly know that this is a boy and there's a girl. And we had a lot of work with balancing those memories so um, none of the characters would be like felt that it's always bad or at some particular moment uh, that it's like a, a domestic violence is happening. Okay, so we had the first solid prototype um, and it had like an animated character and the uh, Unreal World was mostly working. Um, we've changed the name of the equality project to Your Kingdom Come. So it took us around 20 months to get there with uh, three programmers and me. Okay, so right now I will talk a little bit about uh, the modern art. Um, so when, for, for that prototype that you have seen, we had a biggest problem of um, that the world was like looking mostly constantly the same and we decided to explore the modern art since at some point it was based on the primitive shapes. And we found that Piet Mondrian's work would uh, work great because it's based on, uh, on the squares and there are just five colors, red, white, yellow, blue uh, and black. And it worked, so if we uh, used those colors in the Unreal world it was really working nicely. But the thing is that, more importantly, we had those elements that reminded me of the paintings uh, from suprematism. Uh, these paintings are really interesting because they, are, um, they have a 
a, spe a, spe a special way to do them. So the thing is that the picture needs to be uh, looked at as a whole and not as some fragment elements. So if we had in this uh, middle uh, painting a red line, uh, normally the, your eyes would go in that direction. So it's balanced in a way that there are added black squares in the bottom. But the, the most important thing about the uh, suprematism is not actually the painting itself, but the idea. So it's a form of con conceptual art that arised. And like uh, Kazimierz Malevich was uh, saying, it's the supremacy of pure artistic feeling. So I will concentrate a little bit on that um, because I know there's a lot of people that have problems with modern art because they think that it's just simple and why uh, they should be excited about the, the black square on a white background. But actually to understand the modern art and conceptual art, you need to uh, look at the context. So uh, in case of su uh, supremacy, you need to go back to the whole art that was created by men since the, the cave ages and um, understand that the human was trying to reach the realism. And when he finally did it, he knew that we as a human race can do it and we can deconstruct it. And then the impressionism uh, arrived and then cubism. In the end, the suprematist uh, was created and, um, and this is the context for that. But in Bound, we were mostly concentrating on how it looks. So except for the paintings, we were looking at the modern art um, like Bauhaus for architecture. And um, we discovered that the modern art museums have, uh, are made from the shapes that can be uh, recreated in the game. And actually some, of, uh, some parts of those museums are in the game. You can look, at, uh, try to, to search for them. But we still had this problem that uh, those blocks looked similar and similar. So we've implemented a, a simple decal projection system that was putting uh, little paintings on those uh, shards in uh, Unreal World. And it was implemented in such a way that when the shards got um, like dissolved and displaced, the painting stayed on them. So for each of the levels, we decided to make a tribute for modern artists of 20th century. So for example, Laszlo Maholinash, uh, in one of the levels, he was using simple geometric shapes involving transparency. But uh, Laszlo has a, a lot of great works in, uh, in conceptual art. For example, think about this. One of his performances involved calling his friend on a, on a telephone and telling him to draw a, a pen, painting. And when the painting was done, based on his descriptions of her phone, he asked if the painting was actually his art or his friend's. Think about it. And um, next is August Herbin, for example. Um, he was like concentrating on triangles and spheres and mixing them, inverting, and they got into one of the levels of the game. But also Yayoi Kusama, uh, who is also a great conceptual artist, and she is in love with the circle shapes and polka dot patterns. So the implementation was very simple. We had those uh, kind of simple paintings stored in an array of texture uh, uh, with colors and transparency, and we projected the, the coordinates and stored in the vertex attributes of those flying shards. But now I will go to, to dance, which is another part of my presentation. The princess in the very beginning was not a dancer. Uh, the, the design was made by Jakub Jabłoński from Platy Jimic, and she was presented as a runner. It was a part of the story of the game. Um, I will spoil it if I will tell why, but uh, if you will play the game, you will understand. So we were iterating on the, uh, on the designs of the character, and we decided to choose the delicate direction. And at first, we wanted the princess to go through her life and portrayed as a woman, uh, becoming stronger and faster. 
but in the end, because of uh, production, uh, we didn't want it to make all those animation sets and all those characters, so we decided to have just one, um, but she was still a runner. And we hand animated uh, her, and all the animation system is written by hand. It, uh, it doesn't involve any blend shapes, blend trees, because I thought that they were not needed, and I, I felt comfortable uh, with such approach. And at this point, Santa Monica sent us their feedback and was pretty devastating. So designers did not feel like the character was expressive or felt like a female. We need to amp up her animation so that she feels like a unique character. But the, so the character felt like a game character. And we were making a game after all. So. <laughs> And uh, I was happy because uh, I, I was lucky because uh, my, uh, one of my friends sent me um, a movie with a, um, a con uh, with a dancer, with the contemporary dancer, and she was having those kind of emotions in her dance. So I had to do a super fast curse. Uh, luckily, I was uh, training dance uh, with my wife for a couple of years, and helped me a lot. So I started to study on ballet, contemporary dance, gymnastics, and I, uh, even ice figure skating. Um, I started from ballet, and Tchaikovsky was uh, a best start. Swan Lake and Nutcracker are the obvious uh, uh, ballets to watch. But ballerinas have a rigid classical set of moves. It's very rarely, they are very rarely doing floor parts, actually, if you will watch it closely. So it's easy to, um, to show the beauty of motion with ballet, but it's really hard to present emotions. Those moves were designed uh, during a lot of years and they are really strict. Um, but they have a good glossary because of that and it was easier to communicate with the choreogra choreographer. On the other hand, contemporary ba ballet is, uh, has a lot more emotions into it, and, and dance is presented uh, in a more, more literal way. And uh, finally, contemporary dance, um, it's, there's a lot of references on, on YouTube, and it's easier to, to go through them. And I've um, I found a lot of great, let's say, amateur uh, dancers, uh, or dancers who uh, were in a contest like So You Think You Can Dance, like Lydia Phillips, Megan Branch, Olga Kurayeva, uh, many, many more. And at some point I was, uh, I was understanding the dance to this, uh, to this point that I could uh, predict who will win another season of So You Think You Can Dance. <laughs> But there were problems with glossary because it's not, um, it's really hard to find it on the internet to show it's like exactly what move is which one. And it was harder to communicate with the choreographer. So I had to um, cut those movies into tiny pieces and then use tablet to, to show what I'm talking about. But I was also, I was also uh, going through gymnastics and uh, this was like a very interesting uh, time. Um, from gymnasts, I, I wanted to take the cartwheel move, and I discovered that the balance beam motion is really, really interesting. But there is one thing. The gymnastics from the 80s were great, like Olga Korbut and her performances during the Olympics, and also Nadia Comaneci. So those gymnasts from the 80s were adding a lot of graceful motion and balletic moves in between the, uh, the figures. And right now, it's just the points and figures, so I actually didn't take anything from, uh, from current uh, gymnastics performances, and, and it's really sad. On the other hand, ice skating is, is really great, and especially for me, uh, Yulia Lipnitskaya. And from that, I took the motion in the middle. So, going back to the, uh, to the game, the first uh, attempt was like adding a dance figures to, to the character motions. I still was using a hand animation, uh, handwritten system, so I could add 
procedural elements in there based on overgrowth presentation by David Rosen, so the character could look um, where she walks. Oh, this is how the, the ballerina works, <laughs> if you can see. So the thing is that when it's really hard to find a running or walking ballerina, and they usually uh, go more like this, to enter the stage. And this is the, the one moment when you can see them uh, without making actual dance uh, movements. So like I said, the character was still hand animated, uh, hand programmed. And this was the first prototype of dance that we did. It's, it was very, very rigid, but uh, it was promising. So from that point, I knew that there will be a responsiveness and, uh, and the beauty of motion and they don't work together. So if we want to have a responsive character, then uh, I would have to cut down the blending between the poses and if I would like to have a, a nicely, uh, nice movement, then I would need to take off the responsiveness. And I decided to go with the, the beauty of motion. So we were iterating on this and we, we were like finding a new poses and trying to animate them by hand, but at some point it was really, really hard. It was hard to find the reference of dancer, for example, walking on a ledge or a, a, a dancer walking on a ladder. Uh, so, so there are things in the internet that are still not there. So, so there, some, there are still some things that you can't find on the internet. And we got more and more feedback from the, um, uh, from the players that uh, they wanted to dance. So if we will give them uh, possibilities of dancing, then they will just dance in a game. And it was great. So um, it was like the best decision that I did during the project to finally contact the real dancer and choreographer. So we wanted um, a dancer that, uh, that knows classical ballet, modern contemporary dance, and would be flexible enough to perform all, all those cartwheels and, and gymnastic movements. And we have chosen Maria Udot and uh, choreographer Michał Gural. It was like the, the best pick. And the first motion capture session was really good. Uh, the dancers were preparing um, in the, the hall with mirrors for one week based on, on the materials I, I provided. And after that, we were performing the session. It was the first session that we did as a studio, so I was a little bit scared. And also, uh, it was the first day at work uh, for our new animator, and he didn't, didn't work with motion captured animation before, so I was double scared. <laughs> but in the end, it was really, really superb. And it was so good that we decided that we need a second mock-up session, and we decided to change everything. So all the hand animation that we got uh, in the project was um, replaced with the motion captured one, so including jumps. But also we recorded cutscenes and, and they were uh, hard to perform actually. So what we wanted to have is that in cutscenes the character would behave in a balletic way, like in an actual uh, ballet perf um, stage. And it was really hard to, to mock up because we had only animatics, but thankfully we also had the uh, choreographer. So he was looking at the animatics and in fly, he was like showing up the, um, uh, the moves to, to Maria, how to do them. And also we recorded full 25, 30 second sequences. So for player to, to play with them like in a, in a fun way and those sequ sequences were different for each of the level. Right. 
And now I will go to the, uh, to the next stage of my presentation about emotional design. So, so this is the, um, the, most, the, the part of the game that I'm uh, mostly proud of. So emotional design, we, at first we had the first design doc, uh, which was called the equality and was 56 pages long. And there was everything. Like I said, it, it's supposed to be a multiplayer game with, um, with persistent word and, and so on. But from that design doc, only 10% landed and was implemented in the final game. And next design doc was just 11 pages long. We changed the title to Your Kingdom Come. And we had also um, Art Guide, which was based on Vimeo stuff picks that I was like collecting. But at this point, we, we didn't have ballet and modern art. And um, the third design doc was the actual presentation for the pitch at Santa Monica. And um, we discovered that probably the VR was like the, the thing that got the, the biggest attention. But back to the emotional design. So the most important thing, you probably know about it already if you go to the other session, and it's good to tell it more and more and more, is playtesting. Uh, when we were doing Linger in Shadows, we didn't do any playtest at all. You can believe me that we, we shipped the game without testing it with any player. And, and it's, it's because we were coming from the demo scene, and on demo scene, you, you didn't show your demo to anyone because it would uh, ruin the competition. So actually, the, um, it was element of surprise that, uh, that could make you win the competition. And that's why you haven't sh you you're not supposed to show it to anyone. And we delivered that in the shadows. But, uh, but by our surprise, like people still enjoyed it. But the Dratura had only two playtests. And we made the first playtest when we had like 80 or 90% of the game. And when we did it, we knew that it was a disaster. <laughs> so the second playtest didn't change anything at all. So in Bound, we decided that we need to playtest from almost the beginning when we had the working prototype. And we had around 50 of them. But it's important to make it properly. So it's not in a way that the whole team stands in the back of the playtesters. Of course, you do it in a, uh, in a normal playtest, like during uh, the jams or during, during the showcasing your game. But when you uh, make an emotional game, it's really important that the, the tester is alone with the game. And um, because like every single joke, every single word, and every single uh, explanation will break the feeling of the game. So it's good to prepare a, a, a playtest room. So, so this is a room from Santa Monica, but you probably, if you're an, a small developer, um, will not be able to use it. Uh, but you can just have a single place, like separated place, and use private streaming to another place where you can uh, review it. It's super easy on PS4. It's also very easy on, on PC, and it's, I encourage you to do it like from, from the start. And also a good thing is to pre prepare a questionnaire in a networked form, so you could like have those answers and send them to your team. And during the, uh, this uh, like playtesting, during the last ones, we were managed to um, to notice that actually the game started to work. It was very late in the, um, in the production, but this is something that we wanted to uh, achieve, and it started to work. So basically, we divided the players into two groups, those that were emotionally connected and those who were emotionally disconnected. So emotionally connected people were those who had similar life experiences like uh, our character in the game. And from, from this group, we've extracted um, a, a group of players that had cathartic emotions at the end of the game for some uh, working in a therapeutic way. And players from that group were not playing the game. They were not playing the princess. It was princess that was playing uh, their lives. That was known from the beginning that uh, the 
main character, she's a kind of ballerina and modern dancer at the same time. But the story I got to know when I already arrived here, just before we started working, and also the story is a bit touching to myself. It's about the woman who wants to go on with her life and solve her family issues with her parents. Her father left the family, and now she has to decide if she wants to see him or she wants to continue be with her mother or other way around. So I have it myself. My parents, unfortunately, are separated as well. The inner fight is quite close to me. I'm also in that age when I'm trying to make decisions. Whose fault was that and what should I do with it? I think it's nice also that the people who is going to play the game, they would have them to make your own decision because it's a big decision. the chance to see myself put into the skin of the character. It's very funny to see something else moving like you. <laughs> it's a bit abstract, I would say. But uh, at the same time, we have very similar body. She moves as I move, so I make it. And... It's gonna be looking really cool. <laughs> Okay, so in the next part of my presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about Bound in VR. So um, with VR, we had a very first Morpheus prototype. It was Santa Monica Studio who sent us uh, their prototype and it was really nice, but I broke it like in five days. <laughs> It shattered in my hands. <laughs> but um, it was enough for us to play the game and uh, run it. And I've seen that the, the camera system uh, works for third-person perspective. You just need to make it static for, for those that are experiencing motion sickness. And, um, and because uh, the game was showing the actual performance of, of a, a dancer, we, we've made the camera in such a way that you can get close to the character. Uh, but the game was PSVR compatible. It was not PSVR exclusive, so it was really hard to, uh, to deliver that message with the players. Uh, they were mostly prepared that the game is VR or the game is not VR. And we've made the, um, we've made the trailer for the PSVR launch, but we didn't decide to show that trailer um, because it actually looked like a normal 2D game but with a shaking camera. Take a look. But uh, uh, like you have seen in the very last um, the cut of this video, uh, we've made the, the princess to look at you uh, when you look at her. So basically in VR, you, you don't feel like you're the character. You feel that there, you are a third person around her and, uh, and you have a, a visual connection and if you can feel the presence. And when you have a performing art, um, artist, you can feel the presence of the artist uh, in a very close distance. So this is important uh, find because normally when you go to ballet or opera, you can see the performer in a long distance, or maybe if you have like a very good tickets, but <laughs> normally you sit uh, in a distance and uh, it doesn't feel different um, like a TV screen, but with better audio. 
And uh, during the motion capture session, we, we felt that it's really great to be so close to ballerina, and we've managed to represent the same emotion um, inside the VR game. And players uh, really love that. So, uh, like this is a comment, the VR mode in this game is incredible and elevates the experience leagues beyond the 2D mode of play. But I've also um, discovered like recurring uh, messages uh, like this. In VR, it's almost a religious experience at times. So what's happening? Like what happened? Um, I was thinking about the presentations of uh, Genova Chen a couple of years back on, on GDC, uh, when he was talking about the spiritual feelings inside the game. And when we live in a city and see a lot of uh, like human creations, that it's really hard to get this spiritual feeling. So it's easier to, to like get it in the mountains where you can't see any kind of hu uh, human-made um, structures, or in a space station when you can see the, the Earth from a distance. And uh, in Bound, we have a world that is based on, on pure mathematics. So maybe it's worked such way because the mathematics is the language of nature. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you uh, have some questions, then you can use the microphones. Hi, great, great talk. Um, Nicole Zaro from Zia Design. I was curious, on the emotion palette, you know, the emotion architecture or the profile, what were the emotions that were easiest to get in that great combination between the, you know, the character and the, you know, the environments? Um, you mean it's like emotions to evoke in a player? Yeah, I mean, like, were there, did you, actually, it might be just the question itself, was like, do you did you have, like, a list of specific emotions you were trying to target, and then you, did you make adjustments to, you know, to get towards that? So, so uh, in, in terms of, like, um, in emotions in dance, I, I really started from the basics, like the movement, and, and we've, like, we're expanding this, but, um, like, the, the choreographer, Michael, um, was like enlightened me about it, how, how it should be done, and and actually we didn't design those emotions. They were like there after uh, we got the performance captured, and yeah, so we were not concentrated on. It. So it's like emotion in terms of the expression yes, yeah, of the exactly. of the character, not necessarily going after fear here or. You know, joy um, there or we, curiosity we, there. Yeah, we, we had just like a couple of places uh, where, for example, um, fear at this point and so on. We were mostly, uh, and also we got those elements where she was fighting with, with her mm -hmm. fears. And um, this is something that we designed actually, and then it was like uh, made by the choreographer. So, they, uh, for example, when we had the pearls that represents one of the fears of the um, of the character, then the, uh, the, the motions like contain those kinds of, of movements. And uh, for example, another one has the paper plane, so she was like hanging her, uh, um, her arms. So yeah, I, I think that that actually answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Absolutely beautiful game. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, you said when you were playtesting that you'd found that there were some people who felt attached to the game and some people who felt detached. Um, is this kind of like the attached ones liked the game, the detached ones were giving negative feedback of the game? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So um, those that were emotionally connected and based on their life experiences, there were, um, there, there's a part of players that were uh, really liked it and there was another part that really hated it. Because um, I don't want to spoil the ending of the game, but there is a decision in the end. And um, some of them already did that decision in their life. And we asked them to make it another time. And that's why they hated it. But uh, those who didn't make this decision, they've uh, seen it in a game, so they could make the first step. And, and then they could like try to do it in real life. And 
uh, like I said, uh, we made a questionnaire, and in this questionnaire was uh, something like, what uh, decision you made in the end? And they were like answering this, but another question is, why did you make this decision? And this is the moment when they like revealed what they felt about the game and their true feelings. Do you, do you feel like um, the, you know, you're, it's a, I would imagine it's a bit of a controversial game in the sense that it's not a gamey game with enemies and points and respawn and all the usual things that people sort of demand out of games. Uh, do you, and when you kind of like divide your response groups into like the likes and the dislikes, do yes. you just discard the dislike, yeah. or are you sim are you saying like, I how do I get more of those dislikes into the like pile, or do you just say, good, I've identified who doesn't like the game and I don't care about them anymore. I have to make the game for those who have you know who I'm are kind of on my side. So so the thing is that. Um, that was one of the biggest uh, bad decisions that I made in the game to make this kind of polarized audience, one contained uh, with players that are real players, hardcore players like those speedrunners, and those who just uh, want to like experience the, um, uh, the audiovisual feelings and emotions in the game, and they don't want that uh, game mechanic at all. And the thing is that, so what I was thinking, if we will deliver things for the players and fear, uh, things for not gamers, then they will find their path. But the, the problem is when they were like crossing paths and those who don't usually play games uh, went to a moment when, when it required uh, some skills, then they would get frustrated. And those who uh, just want to play a game and didn't find those places where actually needs some skill were also frustrated because they thought it's like it's easy game without the mechanics at all. And there's like a big uh, mechanic that, uh, for speedrunners because uh, the game can be passed in 120 ways and one of the, of the ways is the fastest. And we, we've got uh, like a very tiny small uh, speedrunners working on that and they, uh, they've managed to like, beat the game in 27 minutes, and it's nicely designed because they drop it like a couple of seconds more and more. It, it requires a lot of work, and they spend hours in the game, and they are really happy, but they discover that, so, and they think that it's, it's a game. But in VR mostly, people enjoy the audiovisual, uh, like the presence of the game, and they concentrate on the story, even though those players. So VR works differently on, on real players. So, it, it, so you say, are you, are you actually concerned about the parts of the game that require like a skill mechanic? Like, is that actually fighting the intent? Like, I guess, where have you decided to land? Who is your perfect player? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was like I was thinking that if we we'll, like manage to get as most most players from from different sides would be the best. But um, I think I would go in the direction where those uh, players seeking for emotional narrative storytelling uh, without any skills because they are already tired of of like uh, solving puzzles, fighting, and so on, and just like contemplate on the audiovisual and story side. I think that these are our players. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, uh, could you talk a bit about uh, the final uh, locomotion system that you uh, put together after you got the um, uh, mock-up session and how it was informed by your aesthetic understanding? Like, like does the technical implementation um, like was it in influenced by your ethical understanding of ballet and dance, and do you have like specific example uh, of that? Um, so, so the locomotion system is actually really easy, uh, but we we've motion captured everything, including the the walking, running, and so on. We just uh, needed to add the um, um, the loops for it. And, and it's really, really simple. I mean, it's, we are just blending one animation to another without any sophisticated tools. We don't need blend trees because it's, we have like the one single character without any items. Uh, we don't divide the movement between hands and, and legs. So in this term was uh, really simple, but still what I wanted to do is to have like a maximum, maximum flow of 
blending those animations, including when you like walk on a, on a ledge or jump. So, so this was uh, what I was concentrating on. But as for implementation, it's really a black box. And you wouldn't take anything from, from that implementation. It's just like writing and hard coding. And if I would do it uh, one more time, I would do it exactly the same. OK, interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no many more questions, then thank you.